heartthrob spotted. Must see photos of Sherry Gill's son, Raphael Rogoff. Back in 2008 when Sherry Gill and Roni Rogoff announced it to public that they're already parting ways. After that, we never heard any news about their children anymore. Sherry and Roni secretly got married in 1994 but after 20 years of marriage, they decided to part ways. When they were asked about the reason, they just stated that they couldn't agree where to live. We started to move in opposite directions and drifted apart. No, there's no third party involved. She said back then. Her children Bianca and Raphael chose to stay with Roni while his first son, Jay, stayed with her. We never heard anything from their children until the 19th birthday of Raphael. Sherry Gill posted a photo on her account that comes with a caption, 19 years ago, this precious one was born. He brought the sunshine into the room and into my life. Happy birthday Raf Rogoff I heart you. A lot of people were truly surprised to see the mesmerizing facial features of Raphael. In fact, they were all in shock when they saw how handsome Sherry's son is. Invite you to watch the video Gordon vs. Dilemma on combining death penalty issue with EJK hearings. You cannot control it the way you controlled it the last time. Senator Gordon and Senator Leela Dilema clashed again at the most recent hearing on extrajudicial killings. This was after Senator Gordon shifted the focus of the hearing from EJK to death penalty and refused to hear the witnesses presented by the Commission on Human Rights. We are not taking the human rights out of the question. I just said, under the circumstances, Gordon said in connection with his demand of apology from Commissioner Roberto Eugenio. De Lima then motioned to hear CHR Chairman Cheeto Gaskian who was at the session hall. But since there was no vote, the motion got overruled. De Lima again motioned to defer hearing bills related to the death penalty noting the three-day rule of giving notice to the committee members. But Gordon replied, I will not be dissuaded. You're going against the issue. You cannot control it the way you controlled it the last time. I am not going to veer from the purpose of the investigation. The whole hearings have been so convoluted. The motion is overruled. You may bring it to the floor next time. Things escalated quickly from there when Dilema said. Dilema explained that it was not the proper venue to settle the matter but Gordon cut her in the middle saying noted. Senator Manny Pacquiao then was allowed to sponsor death penalty bill, in which he was one of the authors. Meanwhile, Gaskian and the CHR finds it in a curry to suspend Senate inquiry and released a statement saying, It's not accurate, as the Commission and Bank has not deliberated any position on the matter. The Commission respects the independence of the Senate and recognizes its authority to conduct hearings, in accordance with its own rules. The Commission hopes that the Senate will come up with fair and credible results, cognizant of the latter's independence and competence. The Commission continues to be ready to assist the Senate and its committees in shedding light on matters pertaining to human rights. Invite you to watch the video, Not a Ghost, the truth behind that viral TV patrol video, a TV patrol report about the rape slay case of an 8-year-old girl in Kvite went viral on Wednesday after some netizens claimed to have seen the ghost of the victim in the video report. A dark figure that resembles a girl can be seen crouching along the pathway to the crime scene, at around the 30-second mark of the video, uploaded online on October 6. The video, also uploaded by a fan page on Facebook, gained over 2 million views and has been shared 65,000 times. Netizens were divided on the split-second appearance of the dark figure as some described it as creepy and hair-raising, while others dismissed it as a product of editing. But the mysterious figure is not the ghost of the eight-year-old rape victim, but is actually a witness to the grisly crime. In an interview with ABS-CBN News, the unidentified woman said she was changing her clothes under a nearby bridge when she heard a crying sound at the time the crime took place. It seemed like a girl was crying but I was too afraid to go and see because I was alone, she said in Filipino. The woman was caught on video as she told investigators that she saw several pieces of clothing where the crime was possibly committed. The body of the rape slave victim was found floating near the Las Penas Bucur boundary. Two of her rapists are in jail while two others were killed by cops after supposedly stealing an official's gun while they were inside the police mobile. Invite you to watch the video, 
Robin, I need to support Mariel in U.S. Robin Padilla still has high hopes that he will be granted a United States visa before his wife Mariel Rodriguez gives birth to their first child next month. Padilla and Rodriguez, who had suffered two tragic miscarriages last year, came up with this decision on a U.S. birth because of the television host's delicate pregnancy. The couple explained that they wanted to ensure that advanced technology would be readily available in case of any untoward incident. Rodriguez flew to the U.S. late last month, and has since been regularly consulting her doctors. Based on her Instagram posts, it appears there hasn't been any notable complications regarding her pregnancy. Padilla, who has had to go through more complicated procedures when applying for travel permits because of having been convicted for possession of illegal firearms in 1994, said he is still waiting for the results of his newest visa application. Rodriguez first confirmed her pregnancy in May, eight months after suffering her second miscarriage. She lost her first pregnancy in March last year. She and Padilla are expecting a baby girl. Invite you to watch the video, Bob Dylan, The Musician, America's Great One Man Songbook, What Took Them So Long? That's the only question for the Nobel Committee that finally chose Bob Dylan to receive the Nobel Prize in Literature this year. It's not as if some new work suddenly clinched the deal. Mr. Dylan has been recognized by anyone who cares about words, not to mention music, since the 1960s, when he almost immediately earned an adjective as his own literary and musical school, Dylan-esque. His most recent album of his own songs was Tempest, back in 2012. Since then he has been paying tribute to the so-called Great American Songbook of pre-rock pop, like Shadows in the Night his 2015 album of songs Frank Sinatra had sung. Bob Dylan wins the Nobel Prize in Literature our book critic on Bob Dylan, the writer. But there's no question that Mr. Dylan has created a great American songbook of his own, an e pluribus unum of high-flown and down-home, narrative and imagistic, erudite and earthy, romantic and cutting, devout and iconoclastic, finger-pointing and oracular, personal and universal, compassionate and pitiless. His example has taught writers of all sorts, not merely poets and novelists, about strategies of both pinpoint clarity and anyone's guess-free association, of telegraphic brevity and ambiguous, kaleidoscopic moods. A long-time stumbling block for Mr. Dillon's literary recognition, which eventually didn't matter to the Pulitzers, 2008, or the American Academy of Arts and Letters, 2013, and now to the Nobels, has been that he is a songwriter so his words are best heard with his music. Another is that his voluminous output includes some clinkers and throwaways. Both are absolutely true, and so what? Mr. Dillon's good stuff, in all its abundance, is the equal, and envy, of countless writers who work strictly on the page. He's a grand master of verbal strategies. He can tell stories in a cascade of images, like Tangled Up and Blue. He can come at an elusive emotion from all sides and then twist the knife, as he does in Desolation Row. He can be the kindliest of confidants, as he is in To Make You Feel My Love and Forever Young. Or he can be the most savage of adversaries, as in Positively Fourth Street or Pay in Blood. As much as any literary figure to emerge in the 20th century, he has written words that resonate everywhere, quoted by revolutionaries and presidents, hurled by protesters studied by scholars and taken to heart in countless private moments, thoughts like, when you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. That line, like so much of Mr. Dillon's work, speaks to the marginalized, to underdogs, outsiders, misfits. To live outside the law, he advises, you must be honest. Like many an academically beloved poet, say, Ezra Pound or T.S. Eliot, Mr. Dillon has always placed himself on a literary continuum where illusions focus and amplify meaning. But half a century ago, when guardians of culture were diligently policing boundaries between the purportedly high and low, Mr. Dillon drew his allusions not only from Western literature but also from the blues and the news, gleefully knocking their heads together. In Stuck Inside of Mobile with the Memphis Blues again, he put Shakespeare in the alley. He pointed directly toward some of his sources, Woody Guthrie, Robert Johnson, Arthur Rimbaud, The Bible, The Beats and, above all, the anonymous writers and transmitters of folk songs who told the stories they had to tell. 
he gathered and implied countless others, making him a postmodern pioneer and, eventually, something like a one-man Internet. Mr. Dillon soon emerged as a fountainhead of illusions and aphorisms himself, he's got more one-line life lessons than Aesop. Behind his sunglasses, slinging his electric guitar, he became a writer other writers would build upon until, generations later, his wild innovations were just part of an American heritage. It's a commonplace, but a true one, that there's a Dylan line for every occasion, and another commonplace that a stray line of an old Dylan song can suddenly nail a situation decades after it was written, through the years, his riddles have become prophecies. Meanwhile, the fact that Mr. Dylan's words are written to be sung, that they are physical emanations of breath and pitch and articulation, often adds an additional discipline, the rigorous edict that is built into an oral tradition. There's no place for parentheses, footnotes or explanations, but there are, of course, rhymes. Lines like these, from Isis, combine the matter-of-fact tone of film noir with the rigor of a mathematical proof. She said, where y'all been? I said, no place special, she said, you look different. I said, well, not quite, she said, you been gone. I said, that's only natural, she said, you gonna stay? I said, yeah, I just might. Mr. Dylan's songs do get more mileage, and more shades of meaning, with every inflection he brings to them on stage on his never-ending tour. He can sharpen their barbs, tease out their mixed emotions and infuse them with passion or irony, constantly rescuing them from their own familiarity, constantly recharging his reputation, as if he hadn't already earned it all. But amid the vast repertoire that Mr. Dylan has written, any song has to be strong, almost monumental, to deserve a place in a set list at all. Mr. Dylan's place in literature, the way he drew his very individual, paradigm-shifting radicalism from folk music's memory, its imaginative preservation of tradition, was clear long before the literary establishment deigned to recognize him. The Nobel doesn't have to certify Mr. Dylan. Half a century of literature and songwriting have heard him and responded. Long before the prizes started rolling in, he had already rewired our minds. Still, better late than never, 